undistracted devotion to the Lord. Well, good morning. One of the strengths of our church, I think, is our emphasis on family, which has been quite a challenge during this COVID time. And I have to just give a shout out to all of our uh, families that are here on that, that are ministering with us uh, online, that we miss you. And it is not the same without the pitter patter of little feet running around here. We hope the Lord will rectify that soon. But in our emphasis on family, is it possible that we are not paying enough attention to another part of the body of Christ, and that is those who are single? Are we failing to minister to them? Now, I realize that one sermon on being single is not enough, but it is a start. And today's passage is going to speak about why it is a good thing, a good thing to be single. Now, you may say, okay, well, Pastor, if that's what you're going to talk about, I'll just take a little nap now because I'm happily married. But let's think about this. There is a 99% chance that you will be single again someday, either you or your spouse. But you've got a 50% chance. In other words, it's very unlikely that you and your spouse are going to go at the same time. And so you may be single again someday and there are many here today who can testify they did not think that they would be single again but they are and so that means that this question is an important one for all of us to ask whether we're married or single we certainly want to be able to encourage those that are single um, and the question I want to ask is why is my son coming up here to the podium <laughs> I'm not coming through okay all right, let's try this again. Sorry about that. We're going to improv a little bit. <clears throat> okay, good. I don't want to get stuck in there. Okay, uh, sorry about that. If you're online, I hope you got some of this. We're talking about being single uh, today. <clears throat> and if I am single, how do I fit in God's plan? What, what, what could God possibly have for me as a single person because it seems like most of what we talk about as Christians is how families can serve him or how to be a good husband or wife or how to raise children and so for those that are single they may be lost wondering am I missing out on something and I would like for you to know if you are single that we haven't always done a good job of supporting you please forgive us for that our programs oftentimes are geared for couples and we may give you the feeling like our main job is to try to fix you if you're single so that means either we try to fix you up with somebody and we might be either a busybody matchmaker or we assume you want to just be left alone and so we've sort of been blundering around trying to figure out what to do and please be patient with us we understand that there is a range of emotions that goes on with those who are single. Some are frustrated that God has not provided a spouse for them. Some are distressed because they're in the midst of a divorce. Their spouse has been unfaithful to them or left them. Or their spouse has died. And there might be anger at God for taking them away. Some are quite happy being on their own. Some are wounded. Some are feeling looked over or overlooked. And so with all of those things, please understand that as a church, we are trying to listen, trying to hear. There's just a lot of expectations about being single, and we need to clear the air on that. And so thank God that the Lord has provided for us a passage of Scripture to know how to wrap our head around this idea of being single. That means how do we support people who are single? How do we ourselves prepare if God someday calls us to be single again? Well, last week we opened up chapter 7 in 1 Corinthians. That's where we are. You might want to open up your Bibles there. And we found ourselves in the midst of a discussion on sex. Hopefully we didn't lose anyone there. 
And we noted that Paul was responding to the confusion and hurt and pain that sometimes sex brings. Remember back in Corinth, we said there was four different types of marriage. There was temple prostitution going on. So there was such a situation that was messed up that so many people were just saying, you know, maybe we should just, let's just forget about this. I'll just, we'll just be single again. And that really started the pendulum swinging back even on in the early church where people just wondered, is it just better to be single? Can I focus more on the Lord together or just me and him as opposed to being married? And all throughout church history, we go back and forth about whether it's better to be single or married. The church fathers lived in about the second century uh, A.D., and they uh, largely decided that it was good to be alone and to be single. And so many of them went off into the desert or into the mountains. St. Anthony was kind of a prototype there who lived in desert caves. And uh, he set the pace for men like Augustine, who a couple hundred years later determined that it was best if church leaders were single. And of course, that set the tone for the uh, Catholic Church that even to this day has single leaders. And, uh, and you have to make a, a vow to celibacy, uh, to be either a priest or a nun. And groups like the Shakers back in the 1800s, you may, not the Quakers, but the Shakers, and uh, this was a group that made a vow of celibacy. They all got together, they adopted children, they peaked at about 6,000 members, they, there was no marriage, they didn't believe in marriage. Um, as of 2006, uh, there are four of them left <laughs> there in Maine. Um, on the other extreme, you really have evangelical churches that focus on the family. Literally, that's our emphasis. That's our saying. Everything is geared towards the family. And so again, 2,000 years of not knowing what to do. Should we be single? Should we be married? Is it good, bad, required, suggested, shunned? Which one is it? So let's see for ourselves. Let's just go back to God's word. Let God's word guide our way. So let's look again at verse 1. And we're going to see how Paul is going to talk about the fact that it's good to be single. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. We covered this last week, but it's good to note again that the first verse here, and if we go to the end of the chapter, the last verses talk about being single. So the context for this whole chapter revolves around being single. And the summary message is that it is good to be single, and it is good to be married. We need a balance of Scripture here. You know, the Scripture starts in Genesis 2, verse 18, by God saying, it is not good for man to be alone. The Lord himself said that as he was creating women. Hebrews 13, 4 says, marriage is to be held in honor by all. It's not just for people who lack self-control. The overall design of human beings is that we're made to get married, have a family. That's how we fulfill the command of be fruitful and multiply. We exercise dominion over the earth as families, and that's meant to be the basic building block of society. That's the way God created men and women. Marriage is good. But God has also created some people to remain single. That is an equal part of his plan. In Matthew 19, 12, Jesus says this, for there are eunuchs. You know, a eunuch is, is a man who has been castrated, for there are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And then this is his main point. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Those who can accept this should accept it. The emphasis here and that, in Jesus' words, on those who have chosen to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Some people, by an act of their will or their inclination, express no interest in sexual relations with the opposite sex so they can focus on God's mission, God's work. 
Now, I envision two scenarios here. The first is some men have no or little interest in women to begin with. They're just not attracted to the opposite sex. And this does not mean that they are homosexual. It just means that God has not given them that desire. And the same, of course, is true of women. And there are also men that are attracted to women, but circumstances are just not conducive to them having a relationship with one. And in this situation, it is something that they choose actively to do, and they put their energies elsewhere. And again, both of these scenarios would apply to women as well. The point is, it's good if you get married, it is good if you choose to be single. Now, as we open up our scripture passage for today, we're going to go down to verse 6. We're going to see how noble it is to be single. And in fact, Paul says, in effect, I am single. And it is so great that if at all possible, you should try to stay single. And if you can't, that's fine. It's not practical for most. That's essentially what he's going to say. Look at verse 6. I say this as a concession, not as a command, that I wish that all of you were as I am. Paul was single. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now the concession that Paul is speaking about here seems to be marriage. So he's in effect saying, I wish you were all single. I wish you could all be single like me. But this is not a command. I'm not commanding you to, to be single. And marriage is a legitimate and good concession. Now, the thing I really want us to focus in on here is that Paul says that a person's, get this, don't miss this, Paul's marital status is a gift from God. Look what he says there. Each of you has your own gift from God. The implication is that it is God who determines whether a person is single or married. It is God who determines that. Which is truly great news when you think about it, friends, because it is not fate, it is not chance, it is not the luck of the draw, it is not just whether you happen to be in a uh, target-rich environment for the opposite sex or not. It is God that is guiding. It is God that is gifting. My oldest daughter is in her 30s, and she told me, as she read the other day, that once you get past a certain age, the likelihood of finding a spouse is very statistically low, which may lead and often does lead to panic and desperation and frustration and even anger. And I've heard uh, women lament that there's just not enough godly men in the church today. And my heart uh, aches for them. About, as they, they talk about men just not taking the initiative. But friends, here is the truth, and this is so important for us to get a hold of. God gifts each one of us with our status in life. And that status is dynamic, meaning that he may give you the gift of marriage, but he also might take it away. And whether you are married or single, widowed or divorced, your status comes from God. I know that's controversial, but it's critical that we embrace this. And this does not negate human responsibility at all. It's a mystery. And this is a hard truth, but a massively important truth. Because you can either fight against your status and your circumstances, or we can thank God and we can look for the gift that he has placed within my circumstance. Wherever God has placed me, I can look for the gift. And I can train my mind to look for that gift. That God is going to redeem my circumstance, no matter what circumstance I'm in. That's the way God works. God is a redeeming God. We know that by looking at the cross. The cross sets the pattern. That God can take a horrible thing, and he can turn it around and, and make it the basis for salvation of all mankind. And it was part of his plan from the beginning. So there's that that incredible way in which God can work through horrible circumstances, unjust circumstances, unfair circumstances, and he can turn around and cause it to work together for good. Again, Romans 8, 28 teaches us this. And so the thing is, 
to not focus on the pain or the lack in your life, but the gift. People with chronic pain will tell you this. If you focus on the pain, it makes it worse. That if you live with chronic pain, the only way to survive is to focus on something beyond the pain. And there are some people who are single and so desperately don't want to be single that they make themselves utterly miserable. Later on in this chapter, God is going to drive the point home that we are to live fully in whatever situation God has placed us. Let me show you. If we skipped on down to verse 17, it says, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them, just as God has called them. Go down to verse 20. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Verse 24, brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. In other words, simply this is what God is saying. God is not blessing out there. God's blessing for you is not out there somewhere. It's right under your feet. It's right where you are. It's right in the circumstance that you are in. If you are married, thank the Lord for the person you're married to because it's likely that one of you will go before the other. Make the most of each moment. If you're single, thank God for the freedom that you have because he may later on call you to be married. But thank God that you're in the situation you're in. Now someone may be saying, I'm single because my spouse was unfaithful. How is that a gift? And again, here's the mysterious truth the Bible teaches over and over again. Men and women make choices based on their free will. That's that's a fact. Yet at the same time, God orchestrates all of these decisions to work out for the good of those who love God. And again, that's Romans 8, 28. And that's redemption. You know, Lori and I, in our counseling with people, have talked to many people who say this. We've heard this over and over again. They say, you know what? I would never want to go back to that situation in my life. And yet, when I was in that circumstance, I was incredibly close to God. And there, there are people that we've talked to as well that are saying it was that loneliness, that, that period of isolation or going through divorce, it was that event that actually turned me around and brought me closer to God. They're really saying and affirming something that Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content in whatever circumstance I am in. Friends, what if we approached, and I'm speaking to everybody, single and married, what if all of us approached every circumstance in our life as a gift from God. Marriage, singleness, widow, divorced, all of them a gift. Yes, look at the verse. Look what it says here. The the words are, each of you has your own gift from God. Read that again. Look at it. Don't take my word for it here. God can work through painful circumstances to bring out something wonderful. No matter what you face in life, God can redeem your circumstance. If you believe the truth that God is teaching here, there is a gift waiting from you, for you right where you are at. Unwrap the gift that you have right now. Now, here in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is going to give us two more insights, and they really deal around the freedom that we have. That God gives us incredible freedom as believers here. The first freedom is whether we marry or not, And the second freedom is that if you're single, you have incredible freedoms to serve God and to focus on him. Let's look at both of those. The first one, you have the freedom to be married or not. Look at verse 8. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. Again, Paul says it's a good thing. If you can do it, by all means do it. Verse 9. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry... For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. This has been, this verse has been misused so many times here. 
Because it almost seems like Paul is saying the only reason to get married is if you have no self-control. But again, this ignores all the wonderful things that Paul or that the Bible teaches us about marriage. And so let's think about what he's saying and what he is not saying, okay? Paul is not saying this. If you have a problem with lust, find some unsuspecting person to unleash your passions on. He's not saying that. He's also not saying, if you have a problem with porn, get married. He's not saying that, because here's the truth of the matter. If you have a problem controlling your impulses before you're married, you will have a problem after you're married. Marriage does not cure that. <laughs> this is an area where we have to learn how to possess our bodies in holiness and to, as Paul talked about, mastering your body, mastering your impulses here. That's critical. However, what it's saying is this. If you're happily single and you're content with the gift of singleness and a fair specimen of the opposite sex comes along and turns your head and you begin to get to know them, they begin to get to know you, and all of a sudden you're, you're yearning for one another. There is, a, there is a passion that is drawing you together. What Paul is saying, it is not wrong if you get married. It's interesting, I was reading this week, Jim Elliott, famous missionary to the Aka Indians, when he entered into Wheaton College, he was convinced that celibacy was the only way to go. And he made his roommate feel really bad about going out on dates with other people. And he just, it was like, you know, if you were a real true Christian, uh, you'd be, fid stop fiddling around with girls and go to Bible study with me. And he used to take that approach, making other people feel bad, until he met his roommate's sister. <laughs> Elizabeth, ring any bells? <laughs> Elizabeth Elliot, which he eventually married. And Paul would say here, <clears throat> Uh, Paul would say, Jim, he probably would have corrected him as he was making other people feel bad. <laughs> but he would have also said, Jim, look, I love the fact that you have a passion for the Lord. That's good. But it's not wrong to get married. And he experienced that. And I think the thing that we need to understand here is, is there's an implication and that is, if that happens to you, don't, don't beat yourself up with guilt and also don't prolong the engagement period. Get married. I have never seen an, a long engagement period. I've only seen it work once, and that was when the couple was separated geographically from each other. Now you might say, well, what if we're in high school and I feel that way in high school? I feel, you know, I, I, there's a, a boy or a girl that I'm yearning to be with and I want to be with them. Should we just get married? Well, here's a basic truth about guy-girl relationships. It's hard to get off a train once it's left the station. The advice is don't get on the train unless you're ready to ride. If you're ready to ride, get on the train. If you're not ready to ride, don't get on the train. In other words... If you're not ready to get married, then keep things on a friendship level. You're not missing out on anything. Get to know a lot of people. Hang out, have fun, enjoy company with lots of friends, but don't go all in with someone and have this super intense dating relationship because that is stoking the fires of passion and somebody's going to get hurt. It happens over and we can tell, those of us who have got on that train and tried to jump the train while it was moving can tell you that it hurts when you try to jump off the train when it's moving. It's hard to stop a train. I'm not saying don't date people, just go slow and that's probably all I'll say on that. Whatever stage of life you're in, embrace it. As a follower of Christ, you have the freedom to marry, you have the freedom not to get married, each is a gift. Now, you might say, well, what if I'm not attracted to the opposite sex? That is a great question. And if that's you, then you've probably have people from all different perspectives trying to fix you. Some will say, well, if you feel no attraction to the opposite sex, then you must be gay. Friends, don't let others push that agenda on you. That lifestyle is not part of God's design. On the other hand, some of your Christian friends 
may be trying to fix you and say, you know what, you just need a good man or woman to, to train you and we can, you know, get it to where you're normal. What you really need to understand is this. Nothing is wrong with you. Nothing is wrong with you because God sometimes withholds the normal drives of men and women because he has a higher purpose for them. The truth is you don't need to burn with passionate thoughts about the opposite sex to be normal. That lack of a physical attraction is an incredible and rare gift from God that needs to be possessed and embraced fully. And I know some people like that. I also know some people that I suspect had that gift, but they got pressured into marriage. And I had a pastor friend of mine uh, from a few years back. <clears throat> he had a lovely wife. He had three kids. <clears throat> and he was always talking about how much effort it took to be married and to be a father. And he always just was weighed down by this. And he complained constantly about it. And I finally asked him one day, I said, dude, why did you get married? Why did you have kids if that's the way you felt? And this is what he said. It just seemed like the thing to do. He was a tall, handsome guy. And his parents, the church, society, everybody was telling him, you got to get married. And so he just figured, well, I guess I have to get married. And so he did. And I often wonder how his life would have been different had someone taught us to him that truth. Now, he stayed true to his vow, and he, he, he raised a lovely family, but I just wonder if there was something else that God had for him. The point is, don't frustrate yourself trying to be something that you're not. Be content. Make your single years productive, but if along the way you end up having strong feelings for someone, it's not wrong to marry. If you don't have passionate feelings for the opposite sex, then embrace God's gift of singleness. You're not weird, you're not gay, you don't need to be trained, you're not a leftover, you are a rare but wonderful gift to the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> okay, so you have the freedom to marry or not. That's the first thing. The second thing he says, we find out, and here what I'd like to do, I'd like to skip over a passage uh, here in chapter 7. I want to go to the end because he comes back to this. So while we're talking about being single, I want to hit this. So flip on down to, to verse 32. And here we see that God's plan for those who are single is to serve the Lord un, unhindered. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Now notice that part where he says, I'm saying this for your own good. I'm, I'm not trying to make life hard on you. I'm not putting restrictions on you. Isn't it sad that the church has done exactly that? We have taken this and we have made it mandatory for some people to be single. If you're going to be a leader, you have to be single. That is, it's not from scripture. And we have seen over and over again how that leads to sin and how that, that leads to heartache over and over and over again. Now go back to verse 30, 32. Paul starts by talking about how a single person can be free from concern. And that's really what he's saying here. He said, I'm not, I'm not telling you, I'm not commanding you to do this, but I'm saying this. If this is something that you choose to do, it could be a time of tremendous freedom from concern, because all of the things of married life are not going to be there that, to occupy your mind. Being married does occupy your mind. Somebody says, Scott, you want to go out and do this? I have to call my wife first. That's not a bad thing. We check in with each other. And I can tell you that even after the kids grow up <clears throat> and they're on their own, you're still concerned about them. I got a call in the Tuesday evening of this week, and my son let us know that his 
brand new dog just ate half a bottle of ibuprofen. Cost him $2,500. We're trying to save up for a wedding in March, the last thing we needed. And it just seems like one thing after another, and this is what married life is. It never ends. When you have a spouse, when you have a family, your mind is occupied with their welfare as it should be. The simple point here is if you're single, you have capacities for freedom that you don't have when you're married. And many of the accomplishments of Christ, great accomplishments that were done for Jesus Christ, were done by single people. I think of David Brainerd's work among the American Indians was profound as a single man. Lottie Moon and Gladys Allward in China. 80% of single missionaries are women, are female missionaries, single women who've chosen not to sit around waiting for a guy to, to come and knock on their door, but they say, I'm going to go, and I'm going to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. One of our own, Catherine Kuhn, a missionary that we support, is doing just that. A single lady living in Uganda, and she's had impact, impact on thousands of lives. The truth is, single people go places where married people could not go. They take risks that married people cannot take. They're mobile, they go places, they travel easily, they stay longer, sacrifice more, serve more people than a married person could. And most of all, as a single person, you're free to focus on the things of the Lord and just enjoying the Lord yourself. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. You know, a great example of this is a friend of mine named Ron Colantonio. Some of you who've been here for a while remember Ron. When I got here 15 years ago, he was recommended <clears throat> uh, to, be in our, uh, to be an elder, and so we put him in our elder training program. Um, Ron was a cop, and he's, he's married to a wonderful woman named Bonnie. They had three lovely girls, and those that knew the Colantonio family just loved him because... They're incredible. They, they, were, they just ministered to everybody. But a few years ago, Bonnie's childhood cancer returned, and this time it took her life. And so this model marriage that so many of us looked up to came to an end. And Bonnie's funeral was an amazing testimony to Christ. And Ron and, and Bonnie truly, truly loved each other. And since Bonnie's death, I've had a few opportunities to get together with Ron and have lunch with him and I said, so what does it feel like, Ron? What does it feel like? And he surprised me with his answer. He talked about the loneliness, uh, how much he missed Bonnie. He joined a grief share class to work through his loss. But he also said this. He said there was an incredible freedom now that he felt to do whatever God called him to do. When Bonnie was alive, she worried about his safety as a policeman and so he became a detective, uh, so just to put his wife's mind at ease, I'll, be a, I'll sit behind a desk. Without Bonnie there, he realized, hey, I can go back and do what I really love to do. He took a demotion and went back to be a beat cop, where he's driving around in a car and interacting with people, because that's what Ron really loves to do. And so he's in there with all of these young police officers, men and, and women who are serving in that capacity, they call him Pops, and they speak of him in hushed tones. One lady I talked to <clears throat> said this, uh, she was one of the police officers, and she said, Ron is one of the greatest men I've ever known. So when I see Ron, I see someone who exemplifies this passage to the T. Ron loved being married. He was a great husband. He was a great father. And now that he's single, he is being a great single person. I mean, he dove into the, leader, the, the leadership level of the singles ministry in his church, and he's just going full throttle with that. He is learning to be content and enthusiastic about serving God no matter what his circumstances. That's awesome. Now, I want to ask some questions as we end here. And if you're in a connect group, uh, these are some of the questions you're going to ask. If you are visiting online or if you're one of our online church members, please go to one of our connect groups because 
there's a couple of questions I want to ask. One is, as a church, I want to ask a few questions. And then, as a single person, I'd like to ask a few questions. And so, here are some of the questions. As a church, how can we do a better job affirming the gift of singleness? And then, <clears throat> another question, what are some ways that we can get to know our single men and women? Whether they're yet to be married, unmarried, widowed, how do we get to know them? We don't want to leave them behind. How do we make them a part of what we do here? And then I want to ask the question, is it okay to introduce them to somebody? What do you think? How would you know? How can our singles ministry be more like a great adventure than a dating service? How can we make it something to where it's so great that even our married people are saying, that is awesome. I like being married, but man, those guys are really full throttle on for God. In some ways, I'm jealous of that. How can we make our singles ministry like that? If you're single, here's some questions for you. How can you take the initiative to get involved versus waiting for somebody else to make something happen? You have the freedom to do whatever you want. How can you do it? One of the great abilities that single people have is getting things done. What is holding you back? Secondly, what is keeping you from finding your gift, the gift of whatever it is that God has for you? Singleness, marriage, the ministry that he might have for you, the ways in which love can pour out of your life. How can you turn from anger or anxiety to contentment? And then most of all, how can you make your single years count? Hey, our prayer here is that married or single, each one of us will unwrap the gift that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have made it so where no matter what phase of life we're in, you're always there and you always have a great gift for us. You withhold no good gift from your people. In your body, there's no leftovers, there's no spare parts. Each one of us have a place. Each one of us belong. And so God, I just pray that this message would just be driven deep into our minds. So that wherever you call us, and whatever we do, we will have that sense that there is a great purpose for which I am to fulfill. May this be the testimony of each and every member of our church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.